up and down, so I won't sing a prayer. <laughs> I think we've done enough prayers. I'll sing at the end, one prayer. So, uh, I think we're going to try and, we're going to try and relate being a Buddhist and being a, a, a social activist, a, a political activist, actually. Why not? Well, you know, certainly in our Mahayana tradition, we have this nice analogy that a bird needs two wings, wisdom and compassion. So as the Dalai Lama says, compassion is the point. But that really, that I think is the political wing. That's action, isn't it? Action. Compassion isn't just a gooey feeling in your heart, but on the basis of that, you use your body and speech to be of benefit to the world because we all live in this crazy world together, don't we? That's the compassion wing. So that's action. That's action. That's what it means, you know? Sitting there having a nice feeling is good, but you just put your money where your mouth is. What's the point, you know? But as the Dalai Lama says, but that's not enough. You've got to have wisdom. And wisdom is the nuts and really is the nuts and bolts of Lord Buddha's teachings, the nuts and bolts of understanding karma, how we come into this life, program our own past, how we're our own creators. As the Dalai Lama says, the law of karma is like self-creation, you know, because we know that Buddha doesn't assert a creator. Buddha isn't a creator himself. Buddha actually came, you know, came from his own experience, came to the conclusion from his own direct experience that we've got this marvellous potential to rid the mind of all the rubbish, putting it simply, you know. That's what nirvana means. Don't make it mystical like some alternative to heaven. It's actually this, the term you can use to refer to the, your mind when you've done the job of removing all the rubbish, you know. So the nuts and bolts of the wisdom with are you putting yourself together, you controlling your own body, your own speech and your own mind, abiding by the laws of karma, not harming others. Why would you not harm others? Because guess what? You don't want to be suffering in the future because we are our own creators, basically. This is Buddha's idea. So really taking this on board very first, brings an incredible sense of stopping being a victim, stopping assuming that I didn't ask to get born and it's not my fault, which seems to be the genuine, the, the kind of the inbuilt philosophy we all have. We feel like we've got some prompt on this planet, either by a creator, I'm not being rude, you know, or by mummy and daddy. You understand? <laughs> so somehow we didn't get insulted, did we? You understand my point? So it's very true we didn't ask to get born. But the Buddha says, sorry guys, you created yourself. You, got, you came into this life programmed with whatever you've had from the past and we are actually living out our own past actions. I mean, the materialist view does that, except we go back to mummy and daddy and grandma and grandpa and the monkeys. Well, Buddha says we go back into our own past, speaking very simply. So what this brings, and I found that certainly, I know when I first heard the Buddhist teachings, really the idea of karma for me was very powerful. It, it, it resonated so deeply. And slowly as you learn those teachings, you really start to understand that what it means is you take responsibility, you become accountable. Because what's inside you is yours and has come from you from having done it before, having thought it before, having said it before. We're the ones who do our own programming. This is really what Buddha is saying in simple terms. So that brings accountability. That stops gradually the sense of victim, not fair, poor me, I didn't ask to get born, it's not my fault, which is the irony of ego, you know. We really look at the way Buddha talks about ego in a very simple, ordinary, down-to-earth way. This ego grasping, this clinging to this ridiculous, made-up sense of self which we then have to continually defend with our ridiculous attachment and then get upset when it doesn't get what it wants. This is samsara. That's what Buddha means by samsara. Don't make it something holy, you know. Buddha's an amazing psychologist, and that's not joking. The trouble is we repeat nice 2,000-year-old words, and it sounds different. But if you put it in our culture, it's very grounded stuff. I mean, it's not a joke to say that the mind is Buddha's expertise. Really, you know. And remembering that came from those amazing Hindus before the Buddha. I mean, the Dalai Lama, I always quote this lately, the Dalai Lama said it was these Indians more than 3,000 years ago, who were the ones who began this incredible investigation to the nature of self. They're the ones who created this amazing technique called concentration meditation, this shamatha technique. These Hindus invented it, these ingeniouses. You know, and then Buddha came out of that tradition and diverged in his own direction in relation to his own findings about exactly what the self is and what it's not. So on the basis of Buddha's own experience, then, that's what he presents. He's, he's saying, you know, you, okay, you guys, we've all got this marvellous potential to rid the mind of all the rubbish. And if you have the Mahayana view, we can also become a Buddha. We can add the compassion wing to it in a very particular way. We've got this marvelous potential. And I think this point, I want, I want to stress this point because we're so used to hearing religion, you know? If you look at a Buddhist place, well, not this one, maybe, because it's not a Buddhist place, is it? But you get my point. It looks holy, like a church. You sing prayers, we're monks and nuns. We, you know, do holy things, sound holy, look holy. So we can be forgiven for thinking it's the same. But this really crucial difference and it's not trying to be superior, it's just a question of being very clear if we decide we want to use Buddhist teachings. The crucial point is this, that we tend to think of religion as, as revelation, as something from on high, from a creator who is superior and who created us. Now, I'm not criticising that view. I have immense respect for Catholics, Muslims, 
who truly have faith in their creator and therefore surrender to their creator and, and know it's God's will. That's a sublime view, actually, but it's not Buddha's view. And this is massively important to understand. We attempt to even like Buddhism. Buddha was this regular guy, you know, who did this amazing work coming out of this amazing tradition and then he went deep into his own mind. It's not some, you know, it's not some mystical thing with this extraordinary technique called shamatha, this concentration, remarkable psychological skill that enables you to get to a subtle level of your own consciousness, levels of consciousness that we don't even posit as existing in our culture. That's why we all think it's mystical. But these are geniuses, these beings. You know, these Hindus did it, not even the Buddha. He took their technique. I mean, they don't mind, they'll share. <laughs> Truly. So he just went further, and he went deep into his own self, and he became clear that there is no inherent I. There is no independent I. He came to this conclusion, it's not revelation, therefore it is not technically belief. Buddhism technically is not a belief system. Technically it's not. It has the same trappings. You know, but you've got to be clear about this if you, if you want to follow the Buddhist teachings. Buddha is basically saying, this is what I found to be true. Here is my methodology. It's over to you, baby. If you want to do this, here's what I did. You can follow it. You do the same thing. You, and you follow his methodology. So it's not a question of believing. And it's not a joke to say, you know, we think, you know, you believe in religion because it's mystical, because it's beyond, because it can't be proven, it's from a superior being, and it's, he's got a plan, and that's fine. That's not the Buddhist view. That is not the Buddhist view. We've got to really be clear about this. That's why you just don't blindly believe Buddha. Oh, I, I like reincarnation. Oh, I believe in karma. That's like, that's like saying you believe in mathematics. Who cares? I'm happy you do. It happens to work. Because we all know you've got to learn mathematics, don't you? You've got to internalize it and make it your own. But the same with karma. The same with Buddha's view about the mind. Even the Buddhist model of the mind is coming from these Hindus. Of course, there is variations in the different traditions. But they map the mind internally. This is so ingenious, you can't imagine. Because we don't say it in such blunt words, we don't hear it properly. We mystify it, we get all holy, you know. It's really kind of kind of insulting it in a way. So the Buddha's view is it's like me saying you want to, you know, he has found from his own direct experience that we can rid the mind of all the rubbish. This is so astonishing. There's no view like that even remotely in all our psychology. You know, if you go to your therapist and ask them to please help you get, give you your technique to get rid of all ego, all fears, all jealousy, all attachment, all depression, <laughs> and be blissful and joyful and compassionate all the time for all beings. They'll think you're seriously mentally ill. But I'm we're not kidding. But this is exactly what Buddha said. Can I make a laugh? <laughs> but seriously, but we don't hear it this way. We go all la di da, you know, and we're all mindful and slow. Excuse me. If Buddhism had to want to be slow, I'd be not a Buddhist, I promise. <laughs> you understand? So, so you've got to hear it in a very direct way. Buddha's an amazing psychologist. This is not joking. He deals with the mind, he doesn't talk about a soul or a spirit. He's just an extraordinary being who discovered the nature of the mind. I mean, it's so marvellous to hear it in this way. We should be delighted, you know. And this is the point about Buddhism. You can be a 1% Buddhist. There's not a problem. You can be. You can take so much from Buddhism that doesn't demand thinking about where your mind is. I don't care if you think it's your brain. You can think it's your brain. Buddha said it's not. You don't have to think about karma, even if you don't want to. But if you work on your mind, if you do that part of Buddha's job, you'll be an amazing human being. Because you'll take responsibility. You'll own what's in there. You'll use your concentration, your mindfulness, to recognize your own crazy mind, you know, and sort out this emotional soup. And start to lessen the neuroses and grow the goodness. Simply, it's all Buddha's saying. So then, of course, the more we do that job, which is the nuts and bolts of being a Buddhist, it's your own private work, the inner work, then what is the conclusion from this? How will you be? You'll be a much wiser person. You'll be more balanced. You'll have more equanimity. You'll have more clarity. You'll have more courage in the face of dramas. You won't be up and down like a yo-yo. And naturally, because you're removing the, all the pollution of ego, which is what separates us from others, just naturally, you're breaking down the barriers between self and other, so you'll, you'll recognize others are in the same boat. Oh my God, look at this crazy universe, you know. So compassion, you know, really, if we, take, if we do take the view of karma, Buddha's explanation of the universe, and he did not make it up, I promise you, he didn't make it up. He's not a, he's not a, you know, he's not a creator, like I said, he's observed it. Even these Hindus, these amazing yogis have observed karma. This is the way the world is, Buddha says. It's a natural law that runs the universe. It's his explanation of the universe, and it's dealt with in great depth in all the literature, going back thousands of years. It's all there for anyone who wants to study it. And it's the explanation of who we are and why we are what we are. It's marvellous if you're interested. So 
taking this, understanding that every sentient being, every dog, every ant, every monkey, every human comes into this life programmed with their past, not mummies and daddies and grandmas, with our own past, our own actions from the past programmed into our own mind, our consciousness, and we act that out. When we take this on board and we start to recognise our own neuroses, and then we start to have the courage to accept them, recognise this is causing me suffering, and you know what, I'm sick of suffering, that's, the, that's what renunciation is. You give up suffering and its causes, your suffering, and the causes that you created. This is very powerful. And then you can extrapolate, you're also the cause of all the goodness. Well, this is marvellous, you know. Then you see others, and this is the basis of really having compassion. Now, right now, what's our compassion like? This is a big problem. Because we deepen our bones having the materialist philosophy, and we, that's our world, then we, we sort of naturally assume that mummy and daddy made us, that our mind is the brain, that the, no one understands why suffering, why this, why that, why Russia, why Hitler, why blah. We don't have an answer in the West, and that's the prevalent view in our world. So then we tend to have this deep assumption that I didn't ask to get born, it's not my fault. So then the people we have compassion for are the innocent victims. And that probably comes down to a few children and a few animals. <laughs> not that many sentient beings. Because you've got to be innocent for us to have compassion for them. That's profoundly limited, and that's not logical, Buddha says. And this is a massive point. When we look into our own minds, and we look into the ego, the fears, the anger, the jealousy, the attachment, normally speaking, we just have this massive guilt, and we, we think I'm a naughty person and I shouldn't be this way. That's not the Buddha's view. If we'd actually be crying with compassion with ourselves, for ourselves, then we could see that these are the neuroses that cause us pain. We're not used to thinking this way. We just get guilty and feel bad. But this is why we suffer, and naturally is why we harm others. So when you can know that for yourself, you look at others, and then you can begin to have compassion for the pedophile. And I'm speaking the truth here. Not in some sentimental way. Our view of compassion is very sentimental. We've got to have innocent victims, and you've got to have naughty oppressors. You know, we have love, love all the saints and the sinners. And it's just too extreme. And it's not understanding human nature, what it says. The Buddha's crucial point is when we understand that suffering is caused by the delusions, by the neuroses. And that is why you would harm others. But that's a conflict for us because we think that a person you have compassion for has to be innocent. So we can't work out why would I have compassion for a pedophile. You've got to hate him because he hurt the victim. Well, the Buddha is saying the only reason a person hurts another is because they're deluded. They've got attachment and rage and anger and fears and their own dramas. But that's we've got to come to terms with that first in ourself. And then we can have this humility of owning our own junk. And then we can see that's what others have. So then you understand this more, this, this compassion, this kind of um, stronger compassion, not sentimental, weak compassion. It's compassion recognizing that everybody's in the same boat. Everybody's harming or being harmed. The Buddha will say, of course, in the big picture, we're going from life to har life, harming, being harmed, helping, being helped. Just endlessly going until we start cutting the cycle. So when we realise that in the wisdom we this informs our compassion to understand why the world is the way it is. Then we can see the pedophile, the crazies, the Mr. Trumps of the world, and understand their neuroses. I mean, you know, the world is a really good workshop. You know your own mind. You can check Mr. Trump. Okay, he seems to lie. Check. Got that one. He seems to be attached. Got that one. Seems to be angry. Got that one. Seems to be arrogant. Got that one. <laughs> one of the practices is, you know, when I see Mr. Trump, he's a great work. He, he's a great kind of workshop. I tick all the boxes. I've got all of those delusions. Thank you for showing me how not to be, Mr. Trump. <laughs> then you can see the pain it causes you. Now you know. Even though we'd love to hate the Mr. Trumps of the world, you can have compassion, but it doesn't mean they're all oh, the poor thing, can't help it. That's what we think of compassion. No, you see why the people harm others, why people are doing Their delusions cause them to do and say crazy things that harm others. And then when you have the bigger picture in karma, and it's a tough one for us in the materialist world, that we're all meeting each other life after life, doing what has been done to us, to others, good and bad. You know, so when we can rejoice with karma in our own virtue and our own goodness and our own good qualities, I mean, the Buddhist view really would say, if you really realise how hard you've worked in the past, just to be this ordinary human being here with a bit of food in our mouth, a bed to sleep on, a few friends, you know, a bit of credit in the bank, this is a miracle if you compare with the rest of the universe, and that's due to our virtue. So when we can, when we can own the good stuff, which applies to the same, the, the law of karma applies to that too. <clears throat> and our trouble is we only tend to go on about the bad stuff. We're all junkies for the bad stuff. We always think of karma as one big stick to beat you just for the bad stuff, which is really superstitious. It's just Lord Buddha's view about how things work. 
and much of karma is simply habit. So if we see this, then we can see others in a better light, and then you can be wise. So sure, arrest the pedophile, put them in prison, stop them from harming others for their sake as well. So it's like, this kind of compassion is like the compassion of a mother for her crazy junkie kid, you know? Everybody else can't stand this junkie kid. They think she's terrible. She's a pain in the ass, you know? Ass. We say, we say ass in Australia. No ah. Arse. <laughs> anyway, excuse me. <laughs> my point. We, everybody else can't stand that junkie. They're horrible, they're self-centered, they're neurotic. We know they're suffering, but just please get out of my way, you know? But the mother, her heart breaks because she knows that her she knows her daughter's causing harm to herself. That's the basis of compassion. So when we know in the wisdom that we are causing our own suffering, that is a basis for having compassion for others. And then you act accordingly. So this is like wisdom, and that gives strength and courage to our compassion. So I remember years ago, in 87, when there was sort of a mini uprising in Tibet. And the first time there'd been demonstrations really since 1959. And all the demonstrators were the young monks and nuns. And they were the radicalised ones. They were out there yelling and shouting with their placards. So naturally when we think of um, demonstrating, we think of anger, don't we? So then I remember one of my friends, he'd been arrested in that year. Actually it was very funny, he was about 17 that year, he'd become a monk. And he was demonstrating. And he, he said his mummy and daddy decided to make many Tibetans. So they had 13 babies, you know. I think the Tibetans get run out of the country. Anyway, whatever. He was a monk, he became radicalised. He was a monk, he was devoted. But he became radicalised, you know, radicalised demonstrating. And then he got arrested. He's, then he got tortured, got released. Then he got arrested, then he demonstrated again. His friend, had his, his friend had his head blown off. He then thought he'd better escape this time. So he left the country. Then he heard that his brother was murdered, father was murdered. And he was sad, you know. And he was tears. And I said to him, just very casually, I said, did you, did you, did you ever get angry? And he laughed. Just said, Rebecca, what do you mean angry? What for? It's our own fault. Now those words are our mind are too shocking. Because that's not how we think. This is so shocking. That's so all that meant was that he, as a Buddhist, as a Tibetan, brought up with that view. That's their worldview. You see, we're not used to thinking this. That's the worldview in Asia of a century before the Buddha. It's just the accepted view of the universe. Like our accepted view in the materialist world is your, your, your mind, your brain, you know, and your mummy made you. That's it, we take it for granted. He takes that view for granted. So this is the point to think about, analyse the implication of this view that you created yourself. Think about it. He understood that due to their past actions, this suffering is now occurring. He also understands that due to his past virtue, his happiness is occurring. Speaking of ordinary life here, you know. So when you have that view in your bones, then of course you would not be angry. And this is a shock again in our culture. Because you see, Buddha's key thing in the mind, and this is not the way we think in our world, Buddha makes this incredible distinction. In the Buddhist model of the mind, again, coming from these amazing Indians before Buddha, you can divide all the, all the components of your consciousness, all the, all the components of your mind, into three categories. Speaking very simply, you've got these neurotic, neurotic, eye-based states of mind, anger, attachment, jealousy, pride, you name it, low self-esteem, you know them. Depression. Then you've got the virtuous ones, the positive ones, compassion, kindness, generosity. We're talking relative reality, the ordinary world. Not discussing selflessness here. Then you have the third category, which they call neutral, but they really mean, these are, I like to call these the mechanics of the mind. Concentration, good memory, not forgetting things, you know, alertness. And there's many of these states of mind that are crucial, that are really trained beautifully in shamatha meditation. You become this marvellous person. Now, these states of mind are neither virtuous nor non-virtuous. In other words, as lovers ever put it, thieves need mindfulness. Meaning they need good... You know, mindfulness means not forgetting what you're doing moment to moment, which is a fundamental mental, mental skill we need to do proper concentration and meditation. Well, so does a good thief need it. So it's not virtuous in its nature. All beings have all these states of mind. So the Buddha's view is then, we've got those, that means we need to develop those to help us do the better job. But the virtuous and the non-virtuous, he makes this clear distinction, this is unique to Buddhist psychology, that the negative ones in their nature are distorted, neurotic, delusional, disturbing, and they're the ones that cause our pain. And he, this amazing finding of the Buddha, that this stuff is not at the core of our being. He says we can remove this stuff. That, like I said, that's the meaning of nirvana, ridding the mind of all the rubbish. Speaking simply. Speaking really down to earth. Now that's a fairly radical concept. 
We do not talk this way in our culture. We treat anger, love, compassion, kindness, concentration with equal status. We give equal status and we think a reasonable person has a bit of all of these. But to be so radical as to say you get rid of all attachment and all anger, that's too concerned. We think they're so natural that you'd be unnatural if you didn't have them. So it's hard to hear Buddha's view. He makes this clear distinction. And again, this is in all the texts, centuries old, you know, thought with immense depth. Coming from the direct experiences of the yogis in their own mind. They match the mind, not the brain. They got the microscope of their own mind and unpacked and unraveled the contents of the mind. This is Buddha's expertise, but that's hidden to us unless we study it properly, you know. We mystify all this stuff, we mystify meditation. So when we understand this, then we understand the wisdom we clearly why we suffer. And now we can understand others, and then we can understand why we create their own karma. And then we can realize what anger, for example, anger, you know, anger is or aversion, okay, is the response when attachment, craving, desire, these words are synonymous, doesn't get what it wants. So when we understand this, so look, you know, there's like a hierarchy of these neuroses, I like to say it that way. The root one is this ridiculous misconception of a self. Deep in our bones, so deep it's like at the level of assumption. On the basis of that, there's this massive, constant kind of craving or attachment this bottomless pit of neediness to always get something always out there to fill up the gaping hole. This is the, the energy of attachment in day-to-day -day life. So this is like this motor propelling us and it's ever so subtle. And the millisecond it doesn't get what it wants, that's the arising of what's called aversion. And anger is the stronger level of aversion. Internalized aversion is depression. This is quite subtle, quite nuanced, the way they talk in Buddhist psychology. So when we understand that, that anger is a response when attachment is thwarted. Attachment, the neuroses, <coughs> runs the show. So the millisecond our attachment doesn't get what it wants, we have this panic attack. That's what anger is. So then when I said to this monk, Jig Dog, do you ever get angry? What do you mean, Rabina? What for? It's our own fault. Well, analyze what anger is. What's the philosophy of anger? What's anger? How dare you do that to me? I don't deserve it. Well, Buddha says it's a wrong perception. I'm sorry. You created the cause, honey. But I mean, it's too heavy for us to hear this. But when we realize we're also creating the force of the goodness, then it's more balanced for us. So he didn't have anger. I remember the Dalai Lama saying that these days he's getting so sad because he sees more and more Tibetans are getting, have had anger now. They didn't as a culture because they had this view of karma deep in their bones. You know, they don't get angry in that way because they know why things are happening. They're not saying, why is this happening to me? They understand the reason. So therefore they don't have that response. Sad? Yes. Other things? Yes. So then he was demonstrating, but not out of anger, because it's the right thing to do. To, you know, Tibet is not part of China, as far as the Tibetans are concerned. So they're fighting for their rights, but not out of anger. That's what a shock is for us. We assume if you, and that's why we assume political action has to be based on anger. Not at all. I remember Martin Luther King, it blew my mind, you know. You can look at that man, you can tell he wasn't angry. He was an extraordinary being, you know. And he said, he said, it's good to be angry. He meant it's good to find fault. Oh my God, look at the racism, look at the sexism, look at the injustice, look at the environmental problems. That's called intelligence, that's not anger, that's pointing out a problem. But then he said, now you say, what can I do to help? Well, that's compassion. Compassion is action, but not coming from frustration and annoyance and finding someone to blame and raging on. The world is a suffering place. The world is an appallingly suffering place. You cannot doubt it. There's unbelievable racism, sexism, dramas, terrible injustice. Awful. Everywhere we turn, there's no question. That's a fact. So, but the, the heavy part is, the, the part that's a revelation, where we can work on our own mind first in the wisdom week, is recognize this attachment and this panic attack when it doesn't get what it wants. It's like a child in us. When we can really work on that and understand less than these neuroses, how, the kind of person you become is amazing. You become much more courageous, much more brave, much more kind of grounded, not such a victim, not having a panic attack every time things go wrong. Which is how we are now, all our anxiety attacks and panics and dramas and fears and worries. Look at us. Why well, it's so fragile. That's attachment. When we lessen that, we, we can face the problems because we understand them and we don't lose the plot. And then that can inform our compassion. And so we can demonstrate, we can work, we can help others based on compassion for everybody. So yes, indeed, arrest the pedophile, but out of compassion for him. And arrest the child, no, uh, help the child out of compassion for them, for both of them. That's a tough one, because there's logic to it in Buddhist teachings. You know? And that's up to us, how much we want to take on board being a Buddhist. You understand? What time is it?
Okay, I've talked fast, so it's about an hour anyway, so... <laughs> now you ask me some questions, okay, come on. Now she will tell you guys. Just as well, we'd laugh, we wouldn't laugh and cry, would we? <laughs> come on, questions, people. Now it's only you guys. Yes? Um, I spoke a bit about... Um, a bit louder, darling. Oh, I know you spoke a bit about the practice and sort of gaining wisdom and that, you know, things will sort of clear up in our mind with illusion. But can you talk a little bit about maybe, like, Ethics to guide that? Like, or is there any sort of like... Well, that's Buddhist teachings. Fundamentally, junior school grade one entry level into Buddhism is not even to meditate. That's high school, honey. Meditate's more advanced. He basically says, back off and don't harm sentient beings. Control your body and control your speech. So don't kill, don't, don't steal, or take the ungiven, as Tibetans would put it. Don't lie. Don't jump on the wrong partner. You know, don't misuse your body based on sexual attachment to harm others. And you, and, and then the other three of the speech: don't badmouth people behind their backs. Don't um, don't rabbit on about nothing. Just blur out the mouth with no thought because the person needs to hear it, which is what we mostly do. And then don't don't use harsh words. This is seven little baby instructions he gives us. I mean, there's more instructions just to drive a car. This is just seven little things he gives us as a guideline, a suggestion that we use this as our basis. And then he, then he adds to it to begin to control the grosser levels of attachment, anger, and, and, and ignorance, the three main delusions. So this is really practical advice. But the crucial point to remember here is this. This is a massive point again, understanding the way Buddhism is different from um, the usual, say, religious instructions not to kill, not to lie, and not to steal. This is a really important point. I always talk about it. So, you know, I was a Catholic, okay, very devoted Catholic. I mean, I was naughty and rebellious, but I sort of loved God and all those things, you know? So basically, I've got a Jesuit priest friend, and I asked him, I said, what, by definition, what is a sin? So we know the answer, because God is a creator. God is the boss. God made the universe. God made me. God is necessarily beyond and above. And again, I'm not criticizing. So naturally, God is the boss. So God said, don't kill. And that's why killing is a sin. The priest said, there is some element of natural law that indeed people don't like getting killed. But the logical reason, as a Christian, a Muslim, a Jew, why killing is a sin is because God said shouldn't do it. Now this is quite intense. It's quite a powerful point. That's what makes it wrong. But you look into our world. When I was a little girl in my mother's household and my mummy said, don't do that, I know the reason she said don't do that is because she said so. It's the same philosophy. So if you think about what we mean by morality in our world, it's doing what someone on high tells us to do. So that's why we get all rebellious. Don't you tell me what to do. I'm going to control my own life. Because we assume morality is this kind of repression from above who someone's instructing and therefore someone's going to punish or reward us. Are you hearing my point? Are you communicating with me? You sure? Are you, I'm, you look a bit spaced out. Are you? <laughs> you are hearing. Can you hear the point I make? So Buddha's point is this. It's quite shocking to hear it. He is not a creator. He is not there and doesn't assert one. So when he says, don't kill, it's not because he said so. It's because, guess what, guys? It's going to harm you. You're going to sow a seed in your mind. You'll program your mind with that habit. And because your consciousness will continue in the future, you're going to get the karmic results. So for Buddha, it's like your doctor saying, don't smoke. You don't say, because you, you, know, you might get cancer. You don't say, how dare you tell me what to do. You are grateful when your doctor exhorts you not to smoke because you know it's because they, from their experience, it could, know it could cause you future suffering. This is exactly Buddha's point. But it's very hard to hear it because we have a very moralistic, dualistic view of morality. It's doing, you know, like trying to, you shouldn't be a naughty girl. And this is how ego works. Don't blame your Jewish mother or your Catholic mother. This is the way ego works. We have this dualistic view of punishment and reward. Buddha is not a punisher. He's not a rewarder. So basically, in Buddhism, the first level of practice is abide by the laws of karma. Don't kill, don't lie, don't steal. Why not? Because it can cause future suffering. Like, sugar can cause diabetes. Cigarettes can cause cancer. For you. So you do it on the basis of compassion for yourself. Speak simply. That's the basis of practice. So why should we control our body and speech? 
Because Buddha says the, the actions we do now, being deluded, being in samsara, we've got good actions too, we've got virtues as well. But our, most of the actions that we do that harm others, of course, they're not based on love and compassion, they're based on getting what I want. You lie, you kill, you steal, you hurt others, you, ju you, know, you jump in the wrong bed, you steal someone else's boyfriend, because it's your own delusions. So we're harming ourselves, is what Buddha wants us to understand. This is the basis, the first step in practice. Then we can have the luxury to go to high school and now start to delve into our mind and really get to the root of the problem, which is all the delusions, the neuroses, the attachment, you know? Does that answer your question or not? Are you sure? <laughs> Are you really sure? You're comfortable? Okay, who else? Questions? Yes. Um, so I was thinking about what you were saying about how losing attachment makes you courageous. How being a perfectionist myself, a lot of being what, darling? I'm a perfectionist. A lot of times I'm scared to jump into something because I'm scared of failing or not living up to my expectations. Um, so I was wondering how you recommend losing attachment to like your ego, your reputation, your goals, or whatever, while also not losing that drive to achieve. Well, the key point to achieve anything has to be based on a reasonable. I mean, speaking just normal life now, okay? You could argue, you know, you could. We're not all ready to go off into the mountains, become monks and nuns, and give up sex drives and rock and roll, right? So here we are in the world. So most of us won't do that. So how do we apply it in daily life? We be reasonable. We learn to subdue our crazy minds. So then one of the key things I would suggest is to distinguish between the characteristics of attachment and merely, you know, ordinary, talking ordinary level, the virtuous quality. A wish to do something useful in your life to help yourself become a better human being so you can be useful to others. This surely is a virtuous motivation. So then you would choose a job that you would enable you to do that. So the motivation, you know, the, the factor that determines the actions we do, the factor that determines the character of our actions, the factor that determines whether the thing we do becomes negative or positive is the motivation behind it. You understand that? You understand? So if you have a good motivation to be a nicer human being, forget Nirvana, okay? To be a better human being, that means you'll be more subdued in your body and speech, you won't run around harming others, and you'll do a job that's going to be useful, and use your own energy, use this, this quality you've got to help to be useful for yourself, to grow yourself, become less attached, less neurotic, but to enjoy what you do and offer and be kind to others and help them develop their courage. I mean, this is ordinary human quality. We can get very misconceiving. We can really misconceive Buddha's view and make it all very idealistic. Be more humble and ordinary about it. Do you understand, darling? Because we have virtuous qualities. We have good qualities. So you use those, make those the basis. Does that make sense? And because we live in a world where you've got to have money and houses and bank accounts, then you do this, but very, very relaxed about it. You, know? you do it because it's a useful tool. And that's, that's really becoming less attached and fearful of it. And then you know, and then you know things change. Understanding permanence. I mean, Buddha didn't make this up. It's very evident. Things change. When you really know that's a fact, then you're more spacious again. So then you deal with what arises, you don't have a panic attack every time when things go wrong, you break your leg, the boss fires you, whatever, you're able to deal with it, you're more courageous, and you can be more kind and understanding with others. So it's learning to distinguish, in my opinion, this crucial distinction that Buddhist psychology and Buddhist psychology is unique in this sense, makes between the characteristics of the neuroses, which are eye-based, fear-based, neurotic and distorted in their nature, and then the virtues that are spacious and connected to others. You know, so for example, let's say you even like somebody, you've got a boyfriend or whatever kind. I mean, people have anything these days, maybe girlfriends, or who knows, I don't know. <laughs> We're very flexible these days. So anyway, but you know, let's say you have a person you're in love with. We make, we cannot just, we can't even begin to comprehend, using our Western psychology, the difference between attachment to a person and love for a person. So if you had them, you know, the trouble is, it's a bit like your garden. The weeds, the weeds don't grow over here very poli and then the, 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 very politely, and then leave the herbs alone. They all mix together, don't they? And the weeds pollute your herbs, don't they? Well, your attachment pollutes your love. And it's very hard for us, unless we start looking, unless we start looking inside, to distinguish between the neurotic, needy, frantic, panic-based, I need, and, and all the manipulating the attachment causes to do, to distinguish between that and genuine, empathetic, Affection for the other person, compassion for the other person. It's hard to see the difference. And we can have the theories, which is necessary, but we've got to recognise inside. So then when you're working on your mind with a job or a person, you can see the difference between attachment and, and, and liking it, or wanting to do it for a good reason. And it's a learning process, honey. It's very subtle stuff, you know. But we've got to know theoretically first there's a distinction between the ego-based states of mind, which we all have, and the positive ones. 
There's a massive difference, and that's, that's a unique approach in Buddhism. Do you understand? And you've got to learn from your experience. So when you have affection and love and compassion, they're more spacious, they're connected to others, they're virtuous, they, they cause a pleasant feeling. Attachment and anger, if we had raw examples of those, they're like hell. But because we've got the love and affection tempering our attachment, it's much harder to see it. So it's quite subtle. And because Buddha has, it says we've got this ability to go really deeply into our own mind, again, that's unique to Buddhist psychology, then it's that, that deeper level we really get to unpack and unravel this stuff. So it takes time, you know. But understanding theoretically there is a difference between... Because if we think it's all attachment, we would ground to a halt. Oh, I wouldn't even get off this chair. Oh, I can't get up. That's wanting to, be, wanting to get up. That's attachment. You go nuts. <laughs> what I'm going to function in the ordinary world. You understand what I'm saying? And distinguish the difference. So do what you're doing, but for a good reason. It makes a life more reasonable. Do you understand, darling? Good. Yes, and yes. Um, kind of a follow-up. Question, I yes. believe um, how to operate, move away from the ego and I based thinking in a world that is so full of oh, yeah, that's right. and striving. So, so much harder. Uh, success and that's right. work and how you not subjugate others while still advocating for yourself. That's right. Well, that's the same thing, you know. I think it's a bit like asking how do I learn to, you know, play Bach music if I'm, a, if I'm in a, a family of jazz players. It's kind of, it's not, you know, it's against the grain, isn't it? So you've got you to you know that you want that and then try to have a, some people who support you in that and so you can learn from each other. But you've got to practice it and have the theories and do it every day yourself. There's no, there's no shortcut because it is going up river. It's going against the, the normal. So you've got to be very confident in what you're trying to do and why you're trying to do it. That means to read, to think about it, to do a bit of practice every day. Just keep plotting, you know. And then you don't have to talk about it. You just try to be it. It's harder, but, but, but the more you understand what you're doing and why you're doing it, then the more easy it becomes. But not easy in general. But are, we, are we communicating? There's no, there's no other way to do it. It's very superficial. You know, it won't last long. It's got to be deep inside you. You've got to really understand there's some logic to the Buddhist view of how attachment and anger and depression and jealousy are your states of mind, are not at the core of your being, and you can comprehend them, and you can unpack and unravel them. That's a pretty powerful concept. Not the object of them, not the thing out there that seems to cause it, but the, 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 the states of mind themselves, and that's a tough job. Because you've got to go in here, you know, and, take, and be courageous. That's where the certainty and the confidence come. If it's just superficial practice, it won't be enough to withstand the opposition. Do you understand what I'm saying? And it's not easy. So recognize it's not easy and be humble and kind to yourself. And don't, don't have fantasy expectations. That's so inappropriate. You know? Do you understand? And recognize you're, you're going to make mistakes. So you know, you learn everything. You can't, I mean, anything you learn, you're going to make mistakes. You've got to pick yourself up and try again. That's all. And keep learning from it and have confidence. Do you understand? Does that make sense? Yes. Good. Yes, darling. Beautiful answer, Good. <laughs> um, as I understood it, it's no judging. No judging. No judging. Well, let's be careful. Let's just analyze that. Okay. Good point. Say what you mean by judging. Give an example of what a judgment would be. Good, good point. Uh, no, no. In all, in all things, no preference. So, sorry, what time? No preference. Reference? I'll give an example, a simple example. Bring it right down to earth. Give me a simple scenario so I can understand what you're saying. Give me an example. My question, I have a question for you, is to understand what you said about in Buddhism is no judging. Don't judge a good or bad. No, I'm it's trying to, well, I, I hear your words really clearly. May I ask you a question? To really comprehend each other. I'd like you to give me a simple example in daily life about what you are talking about, so we can be really clear with each other. Give me a simple example in which that might occur. Give me an example. That helps. Absolutely. For example, um, and for example, if the clothes I'm wearing now, yes. somebody say, hey, it's beautiful. Yes. Another person may say, I don't think so. Okay, good. Because good. we all have different Different opinions. Right? Good. Now, right. the, great. Now, the question is? Yeah. The question is, if there's no good or bad, it's yes. different opinions back to you. Yes. Which means, Suffering in the self is what it is. It, it is part of life. It so is, what's the question, darling? The question is... In that perfect you, example you gave, give me the question. My question is, I think then suffering in the self is No, that's a statement. Suffering. I want a question. That's a statement. That's a really good what, point. What, give me a question. What do you think suffering in the self is not suffering? 
Oh, that's completely confusing me. Go back to the first point. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to me, honey. There's too many thoughts raving on in your head. I can hear you. Go back to the first point. You said someone says what a lovely dress. Another person says what an ugly dress. So that what you're saying is that's called judgment. That's called one person saying good and one person saying bad. So now ask me a question about that. What's your question? Oh, that. Well then what's I'm your question? About... <laughs> no, you do have a question because you made an assumption that you shouldn't judge. So I need to I want to discuss that with you. So you've got to come up with a question. You do have a question. You're asking, is it appropriate to say I like that dress but I don't like this dress? Maybe that's your simple question. You're assuming Buddha's saying you shouldn't do that. So I'd like you to huh? <laughs> What are you saying? What's your point now? My point is mm -hmm. Suffering itself is not suffering. I don't know, you've lost me again. <laughs> What's it got to do with good and bad? Exactly. What has it got to do with judgment? Listen, honey, I, I, forget your question. I'm going to answer your question whether I like you like it or not. I'm going to answer <laughs> my way. Okay. I think your misconception at a relative ordinary level of reality of life yes. is mistaken. It is, Buddha is not saying. That's like saying, well, there's a piece of cake that's got poison in it, and there's a piece of cake that will make you healthy. Ordinary level. And you're suggesting Buddha's saying you shouldn't judge. That's called nihilism. That's insanity. If you're going to think that the poison cake is the same as the other cake, that's just ridiculous, sweetheart. That, I would suggest, at the most ordinary level of life, is a misconception. Buddha is a practical guy. He would not say that. I think, you know, Buddha's got all these very profound teachings about selflessness. There is no this and no, the way he talks about the eye, that's way more advanced. So forget that level. Keep it simple on the earth. It is, a, like Martin Luther King said, it is appropriate to say there is racism, there is suffering. If you say, oh, you shouldn't judge, and you see people being abused, oh, I can't judge, that that can't be abuse, that's madness, darling. You've got to have an ordinary mind and open your eyes and you see this person kicking the dog. That's not appropriate. That's called suffering. You see this, you know, your politician harming another politician. You don't believe in it totally because you might be wrong, but you've got to recognise there's war here, there's poverty there. Are you with me here? That's not judgement, sweetheart. That's called common sense. Recognising a chocolate cake as a chocolate cake and not the poison cake is called common sense. It's not judgment, but being attached to your view, that's the problem. If you're obsessed with your view that you're right and how dare someone criticise my dress, that's the problem, darling. That's the problem. It's more subtle than you're making it. I can just tell you that. Will that do for you for now? Yes. That's a pretty good one. <laughs> yes, back there, and then there, and then there. Yes, go. I think you just answered my question. Well, that's good, isn't it? <laughs> Kill two birds with one stone. We're going to talk about the relationship between compassion and boundaries. But what I was hearing with her talking about whether it's a poisonous piece of cake, I can feel compassion that it could have to be a poisonous piece of cake, but doesn't mean I have to eat it and take it into my life. So give me a simpler example. Give me an ordinary scenario. I, say, I, I help people a lot. Okay. Sometimes. Good, helping other people. So you mean like, for example, you've got an alcoholic brother and you try to help him. So yeah. give me a question in relation to that scenario. Well, give an example. That scenario, it's like that compassion for him is being loving and caring. Right, but, but based also, upon wisdom, but honey, when it's based on wisdom, you will do what's appropriate for him, not more and not less. So our trouble now is, because, you know, we have attachment. And when we understand that attachment in all of us is very deep inside us, and there's this little junkie inside us that only wants what I want. It's very deep inside us. It sounds very <laughs> kind of shocking to say it this way, but attachment is this deep, panic-stricken need in us to get what we want. That's attachment. So if I mix my attachment, if I mix my compassion for my alcoholic brother with attachment, 
That's what causes the problems. That's what prevents us. That's what causes us to rush in, be all sentimental, oh, and help these poor people, help these alcoholics, help that poor junkie, help that gunman, and then we end up getting hurt because we've, got, we've not got any wisdom. So having attachment makes a mess of our compassion because it becomes all emotional. So then you start sticking your nose in your brother's business, you start bullying him and manipulating him to change because your attachment can't stand that he's an alcoholic. It's upsetting your life. We don't dare to think it like that, but that's what attachment causes. So it causes you to have no common sense and you get all sentimental and then you, are, then you bring him into the house, the poor thing needs a home, and then he abuses you. That's sentimental compassion. So compassion, when it's genuine, has to be mixed with some wisdom, which is common sense and intelligence. There's only so much we can do to help people. So of course, if we're at the level of the great body suffers, who I remember one lama said, well, the great body suffer, or the great holy beings, the great arhats, anybody who's a holy being who's got immense compassion and no ego, they will happily cut their hand off for a starving animal. And for them, the action will be as inconsequential as a leaf falling off a tree. I mean, way to go, baby. That's genuine, literally egoless compassion, such compassion. But we have to recognise our own limits. So if I can only help a person to this degree, I can't do more. That's like, you know, someone's got cataracts and you rush in with a scalpel thinking you can help them and you're not a surgeon. Well, I'll ask you to mind your own business and leave you with my cataracts. Please. So <laughs> compassion has to be mixed with wisdom. Do you understand? You've got to know what your capability is. And wisdom, often we do not, and that comes from lessening attachment, lessening our own fears, being more realistic. So we help as much as we can, but we can't change the whole world. We can't make it all perfect. We do what we can, but mix with intelligence, and then we don't give up. Because it's all emotional, we give up eventually, you know? Are we communicating? Or not? I'm sorry? Are we communicating? Yeah. Am I answering your question? You did. Good. I wonder if I had someone that I, that did leave. What, darling? I did have someone that did leave my life that I invested in, but I knew it was healthy, and it didn't hurt when they knew it was better for both of us to separate. Sure, that's, that's common, well, common sense. Yeah, so I have some of that. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Good, well done. Someone over here, yes. yes. Um, so, you obviously talked about activism being grounded in compassion. Um, and wisdom. And wisdom. Absolutely. And so I wanted to, I guess, um, talk about, I guess, the need for that compassion. We've seen a, ra a rise in hate crimes. And yes. just how activism essentially is essentially about change. And so how do you combine those elements of compassion and wisdom, for example, when dealing with people who are hate-filled? And this is happening in a very direct engagement on a daily That's right. daily plane of course. In, in the last... Yeah. So dealing, so I mean, if you personally meet a person who's full of hate, you, keep it simple. Are you meaning how would you deal with it? Yeah, how would you use that type of ethic to deal with, not yeah. just on an individual basis, okay. but the fact that it's... Well, I know, I understand. Aspect. The key to this is not compassion. The key to this is wisdom. So when we can understand that from the Buddhist perspective, as we get some concentration, as we understand good ethics, as we understand Buddha's view of the mind, as we understand the way attachment functions, like this deeply instinctive, primordial, panic attack junkie in there, we don't notice it's so subtle, but it's frantically wanting to only get what I want. This is what attachment is, it's kind of wicked. It's, but it, it, and it, it, when we've also got goodness, it's harder to see the attachment. But you know, do you understand, if you see a person you know who's just full, like one of the hateful people you're talking about, they are driven by their own intense need to get what they think is right. Then that gives rise to anger. Anger is the response when attachment doesn't get what it wants. So you, when you know that in your mind, then you can understand this person. Because basically when you've got a strong attachment to your view or your boy or your cake or your handbag, whatever it might be, then you, you can't... It's, it, it causes a panic attack when you're going to lose it. So that's what causes anger. Anger is the response to thwarted attachment. But honey, you won't understand that in the hateful person until you understand it in your mind. So I guess the first point is that. So when you lessen your attachment, what you're doing is really then practicing patience. What well, you see, what anger is, and it happens a thousand times a day. You know, you don't have to wait till you, you, you have a like a, a big dr a, a car accident to realize you've got attachment. You just drop something while you're washing the dishes. What's the response? You get annoyed, right? You get upset and you hear a loud noise. You get irritated when someone doesn't answer you properly. You get upset. These are polite words for anger, but they're mild anger. We realise there's attachments in the mind all the time, like a motor running us. 
It's very subtle. Please understand me. It's always there informing everything we say and do. So what happens throughout the day when the eye doesn't get what it wants? You get annoyed. How dare I broke a cup? Kick. How dare the red light be there? We get upset and annoyed. We're practicing anger all day. So when we can see this dynamic, the relationship between attachment and aversion at a tiny level, then you get brave in the face of the red light. That's only cool. It's a red light. I can handle it. You just practice patience. You just went past the attachment to get the, red, the green light and accepted the red light. Buddha says, if you can change something, go change. If you can change the light, please change it. <laughs> Meanwhile, if you can't, you relax. So when you know that this is powerful wisdom we practice, then you become more brave in the face of a hate-filled person who is really confronting your attachment. Because you, with all of our attachment, only wants the nice things. So naturally, attachment can't stand seeing a hateful person, can't stand seeing rapists and pedophiles and murderers and Mr. Trumps. Are you kind of hearing me? Attachment has a panic attack. Attachment is a little baby in this that wants everything to be nice. If we can get it like this, we understand this, then when you realise you're not going to meet nice things all the time, you're going to meet red lights and mean person, not to mention hateful people. When you understand that, you're more courageous in the face of them, and they won't cause you to have a mental breakdown. You'll know why they are the way they are, and you won't have a panic attack, and you'll be more clear in the face of it, and you'll do what you can. Are we communicating? Sure, um, and I was talking, I was asking more about that next level, which is, if, let's assume... Excuse me, this is bloody more profound level. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> well, excuse me, honey, you're really missing the point. I'm talking about the next level. That's advanced. If you get this it next level... Activism. Act, excuse me, honey, then you haven't heard me. Because you cannot act until you've done this. No. Please believe me. You can't possibly act properly but based on wisdom and compassion, which is fearlessness and not anger, but clarity, understanding why it's happening, which you've got to do in the wisdom. That's my answer to you. This is the whole point. When you know clearly about attachment and anger, you will be an activist and a valid one. You won't freak out when you dare to meet some racist who thinks you're some black whatever. You won't have a panic. It won't worry you anymore. And I'm serious. That's what I'm talking about then you won't mind the hateful people. And I'm not joking. That's what my dear dog monk friend, when he's being tortured, he doesn't have anger because he understands why they are the way they are. This is what, I, what I'm saying is profound. We, scr we scrape over that level. We, we don't go deep enough. Because fearlessness is what comes from working on your own mind. Then you know the world is a nightmare. You know there's hideous, hateful people. You, but you understand it. Then you don't have a panic attack. Then you won't give up either. As the Dalai Lama said, you know, the, the journalist said to him, it seems like anger is good. It gives you energy to fight. He said, I understand your point, but when it's anger that's motivating what we're doing, it doesn't last. Especially righteous anger, you know. All these hateful people, I'm right to hate them all. I'm not saying you're saying that. Then it doesn't last. It, it, the bubble bursts, so we're becoming, we're becoming different. But he said, but if it's based on compassion, which is based on wisdom, then you will never give up. And you also won't have fantasy, like making your, you try, you're not trying to make your alcoholic brother all perfect. You know it's up to him, you can only do so much. So you don't get a mental breakdown and get stressed out and then give up. This is related to the wisdom wing, and that informs your action, darling. That's the point. Can you hear me a bit better now? Thank you. Are you sure? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> yes, yes, and yes. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, just a question about will. Um, you know, these days we're given. I guess philosophical arguments that no one has free will. That, okay. that between reality and reaction, there is no space. We just react. Okay. And that we're born with the calm we have and we just will unfoil and unroll. Who says this? Whose view is Well, I think a modern philosophical argument now modern is that we don't, have, yeah, we don't have free will. These okay, days. well, first of all, can we analyze what free will is? I think we should give our historical sources here. It's a Christian teaching. So if, you, if you're a Christian, please use it. But I never use that concept. But we talk about it so commonly now as if it's some scientific finding. Buddha would disagree with a concept called free will. It's a bizarre concept. Free as if it's not dependent. Buddha would say, it is dependent. Right. Free will is a Christian teaching. I'm not being rude, but you know, Jesus was supposed, God was supposed to give us it when he made us. So I don't want to discuss free will. You mean, what you perhaps mean is, how, what is the basis for our ability to make choices? Is that what you're discussing? I guess, yeah, between reality and reaction. Well, well, Instead what of just reacting. Well, maybe Give that's an exactly scenario again. Okay, so so something up until, up until this point in time, I I I have no I have no way of affecting the past. So I have what I have now. That's my reality. 
And then if I just keep on living from this point without thought and without mindfulness, then I'll just I'll just keep on following. Yeah, that's what we're driven by the force of our That's yeah. exactly right. That's what we get. That's that, so it's not that's really that's good. Hard. In that moment between reality and reaction, there is choice. Well, I can't get that. So I can't talk that way. So how do I say it? I mean, no, no. Is, there a, is there a no. space for thought and no, mind? No, it's not a question of that. I, I would say it's this. Okay. Okay. What the Buddha is saying is that we come into this life with these various karmic imprints, because we create ourselves, if we try to get that concept. So one of the ways our karma ripens is in terms of our personality traits, our tendencies, our characteristics, our, our, what we like, what we don't like, what we're good at, what we're not good at, very simply. And that's, it's, it's, that's called a bunch of habits. We're basically born programmed with a bunch of habits. Whose habits? Not mummies and daddies, our own. Can we hear that point? It's a really practical point, and that's our personality. Now we, now we can suggest, if you want to look at Mr. Trump for who he is, we can suggest by the way he speaks and does things. We can maybe extrapolate and say what his characteristics are, his personality traits. And that's the same for all of us. So we have to look into those. So, now, if you have come into this life programmed because of your powerful past virtue, you'll come into this life and you'll be like this three-year-old son of a friend of mine when she was taking the lice out of his head and he was in tears of compassion for the lice. Mummy, mummy, don't hurt them. It's their home. Leave them alone. <laughs> he was doing everything he could to stop mummy from hurting the lice. Now, she hadn't had time to teach him this. He's three. Now, that's karma. He was propelled by the force of his past, the force of his past virtue. So you could argue he didn't choose to be compassionate. He had programmed his mind in compassion. Now, what a great way to live. How marvelous that we can come into this life program with any virtue at all. And all of us have. So this is practice. So equally the same. Another friend of mine said about her little boy, he was probably three or five, she takes him fishing, or he takes the partner, daddy takes him fishing for the first time, and he falls in love with fishing. So that's also kind of tendency. He followed his tendency to fish. Well, I'd be fortunate if we have virtue to follow. We, that's a good, but then when we have awareness of this and we can recognize I've got a tendency to want to kill or lie or steal and you're using your, your mindfulness, your concentration, which everybody has when you practice this meditation technique, then that part of your mind is observing this tendency to lie and kill and steal. You've just read Buddha's teachings and you recognize, oh, Buddha says don't kill, don't lie, don't steal. Well, that's interesting. And you compare that with Buddha's teachings and you go, oh, oh, your intelligence says there's a tendency to kill, lie and steal. And that's what objectivity, that's what concentration brings. So those parts of you, the intelligence and the clarity, then because you've read it, it makes sense to you, then you, quote, unquote, you decide not to kill, not to lie, not to steal. Now, if those habits are so strong in your mind, and you even, you hear about not killing, you can say, what an idiot. Because your habit is so strong to kill. I remember friends of ours in Boston, on certain, in the lunar calendar, in the Tibetan calendar, they have certain days where they say they're very potent days for creating virtue. So on that particular day, our friends in Boston always buy a bunch of lobsters in Maine and save the lobsters. They release them. It was like 436, and they, they happened to be on the local television news. Well, the local lobster fishermen got so insulted, they said, they dragged in the television news, how dare those Buddhists insult us. So they caught exactly 436 lobsters and, and they just approved these ridiculous Buddhists. Now, you can say they heard about killing, but they just went against it. They continued to kill even more. So that in a sense, you don't have much option to choose if the habit is very strong. So, include, so choose is necessary if you want to change. You've got to have many factors in there. You've got to have intelligence, concentration, and mindfulness. You've got to have some kind of virtue that can even empathise and recognise that a fish might be like to kill, might not be killed. That's put all these bits and pieces of your mind work together, and that becomes I choose not to kill. So it's quite subtle and nuanced. It's not just this ability to choose yes or no. It's more way more subtle than that. It depends on your tendencies, though. Do you understand my point? Yeah, totally, totally. So you've got to have. So then, aren't we fortunate? Let me come into this live program with some virtue. This is how come we're sitting in this room. It's like a miracle if we compare to the world. And that's not to be arrogant. How marvellous. So that tells us let's keep creating virtue. But then that's why this Buddha's view of the mind is so amazing, in my opinion. And you learn these three different cate categories of states of mind. And you learn these third category, concentration, good memory. There's many of them. Alertness, there's, uh, vi there's recognition. There's many states of mind, and they speak very deeply about these. These are like the mechanics of your mind. That whether you're a sniper or a meditator, enable you to do the job better. And they need to be trained. Do you understand? And that's in the meditation. Then you can use that to recognize the virtuous thoughts, distinguish from the non-virtuous. It's a type of intelligence we need. 
And then on the basis that it might be hard work. I mean, you know, look at our attachment to food. We might run around attached to jumping on little girls all day, but we've got attachment to food, baby. And that might, you might live with that for a day you die because the habit's very deep. But every day you're exercising your control, you're disciplining yourself, you won't eat, you won't eat the fourth piece of cake. And it's a difficult. The habits are very deep. So we shouldn't think they should all go overnight. They won't. But exercising, that's why the first level is control the body, control the speech. The mind is going berserk. But you control, and you will get the benefit from this. So it's a lot of work in there, and there's many parts of our mind all working together. It's more subtle than me choosing, having the ability to choose or not choose. It's not totally fixed like that. Are you hearing me? It's way more nuanced. Do you understand? Who else? Yes. Yes. Um, I, have, I have a question about um, karma and, and uh, in the terms of reincarnation. We were karma and reincarnation, yes. So you were talking about earlier how the Buddha says that we're born pre programmed. Yes. Um, but it, it feels like a contradiction. Why is that? Because to assume that I have, you know, my own little pocket of self uh -huh. that is, you know, separate, you know, even before I was born. Separate from what? Separate self from others, you know. What, oh, okay, so, so you, you think, so you mean we're not separate from others? Well, it feels like, is that, a, it feels like, it feels like that's an ego attachment to feel what like is? I have my own, uh, pa my own past. Well, hang on a second. Um, okay, have you got any? Have you got any skills in this life? Any um, skills? Sure. Give me an example of one. Um, cooking. Good. Okay. Good. 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 Thank you. So you could cook. Right. So where did that? Where did the ability to cook? What was the core, the main cause of your ability to cook today? What's the main cause of it? Uh, hunger. Sorry. Hunger. No, dear. More simple. The fact that you cooked yesterday. And what, what was the cause of your ability to cook yesterday? Well, guess what, darling? It was your ability to cook the day before. And what was the cause of your ability to cook the day before? It was your habit from cooking the day before. And what was the cause of that? It was the, the tendency in your mind to cook. That's the meaning of karma. So then when you cook, I don't think I become a better cook. I have to practice cooking myself. So given that in this samsara we are all these individual selves, Buddha says we've made all up this nonsense of being individual selves, but it's a reality. But he says we can go beyond that reality by practicing and changing. When you have infinite compassion and go beyond ego, your sense of self, if you like, speaking ordinary language, is as vast as space. You'll be infinitely empathetic, infinitely kind. But it's fairly logical that the habits you have are definitely your habits, and they don't come from my habits. You know, if you play piano every day and I suddenly turn up and play Bach, well, I, my God, you better keep you better keep practicing piano, honey, and I'll sit back and eat popcorn. That's just not how it works. But I guess the question is, I can understand that logic in yep. this life. Well, no, you hear Buddha's view, but your consciousness is not physical. Let's just take Buddha's view as our hypothesis here. Your consciousness is not physical. It does not come from your mother and father. It does not come from a superior being. It does not come from nothing. So at the time of conception, what conception is, basically, is when the subtle level of this continuity of consciousness that we call yours, we, if you had perfect memory, you could track it back to an unbroken chain of mental moments, right back to the sense, the time of conception in your mother's womb, okay? If you had perfect memory, you could do that. Are you accepting me so far? If you, well, okay. You live at the, you're existing at the moment. You, you, you're alive, aren't you? You seem to be a live person. Which means that the consciousness <laughs> mixed with this body of yours. Buddha would say that's your mind. So if you can have perfect memory, you could track back every second to the day before, day before. If you had perfect memory, you could do that, couldn't you? And eventually you have to keep tracking back to when you began in your mother's womb. For this person we know here today, would you accept this so far? Sure. Good. So that at the time of conception, what that is, is the egg and the sperm from mummy and daddy, and they work very hard to get them together, honey, I promise, <laughs> coming together, and then what made that egg and sperm turn into your body was the entry the second before of, of the subtle level of this very continuity of consciousness that had existed from before, 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 like a river of mental moments. And that consciousness came into those egg and sperm totally programmed with all your tendencies, with the karmic imprints that determine your experiences in this life, with the karmic imprints that even cause you to become a human being. You're like one the lottery, your mind running to that mummy, human mummy and daddy. Those tendencies were programmed in this continuity of consciousness that came from before. So then there's a billions and billions and billions of seeds in that consciousness from billions of past lives, Buddha says, but just a little baby pocket of them manifested as this particular package. 
not as a lion, not as a dog, but a human body with human tendencies and certain characteristics. They are your personal tendencies. Of course they are, like today. But no difference in the logic from you, you came into this life with compassion like that little boy. That's because he practiced it before. Mozart clearly has practiced something like that before. Mr. Hitler has clearly practiced something like that before. And we come programmed with our own stuff. Not mummies, not daddies, not the monkeys, not the creators, not coming from nowhere. That's a lot of spelling out karma. So there's a tiny... Huh? Does, so then, does Buddhist belief, or is there a... What is, what is the, the, the view on this, uh, this conscious, uh, continuity? What's that? Does the conscious continuity blend with other consciousness? Well, you can just ask your own self that same question, darling. When you cook, I don't suddenly become a better cook. It proves we're not blending. Well, but if, before I would, but darling, before if you I blended would. with other consciousness, you'd end up with a Hitler's tendency. Oops, got the wrong one. What a pity. <laughs> with a bunch of habits, whether it's this life or past, the, to the, the tendency is the same. It needs looking into, and it's not a belief, it's Buddha's, it's Buddha's experiential observation that this is how it works. That's why he says, don't believe me. Go check it out, learn the theory, and then eventually you'll realise this yourself in your own mind. That's the Buddha's view. It's dealt with an immense depth in the literature, sweetheart. It's enormously built in, the way this works. And this is the part that's shocking to us. This, Buddha says this is a natural law. That's like botany is a natural law. No one made botany. No one made mathematics. You know, the clever Arab guy back before, he went against that silly Italian lot with their X's and their V's and their I's, and he came up with zero to nine. What a clever guy. But he, didn't, he didn't create, this is a major point, he didn't create mathematics. Mr. Darwin, whoever it was, or whoever it was, the other one, didn't create gravity. They simply used their intelligence and they observed the laws of the universe and articulated it. We call that science. Buddha says the same about karma. He has observed in the subtlety of his own mind that this is the way things work. This is why happiness, this is why suffering, this is why dogs, Hitlers, humans, everything. It's a vast philosophy. I'm trying to give the simple explanation of it. Are we communicating? A little bit. Good job. It's all in the books. You're up to you, I'm studying it. <laughs> yes, go on. When dealing with a person that is very selfish, yes. is, is it more, are we to have more compassion towards them or create boundaries? No, darling, there's no contradiction. You see, that's the point. There's an assumption. That's a very good question. The assumption in your question is that compassion is all soft and gooey and you bring the person in. That's like having compassion for a python and inviting it into your bed. I think you'll wake up dead, baby. That's stupidity, not compassion. That's what I meant before. So compassion is understanding a person's suffering, but the crucial point, darling, is knowing their mind, which is what causes them suffering. So if a person's like a real junkie, a person is a rapist, excuse me, you keep out of their way. That you have compassion, you realise they're driven by this crazy habit, but you'd be very intelligent to keep out of their way. So if there's a person in your life who's very selfish, you do not criticise, but you are fortunate that you can see that they're very selfish, don't dump too many things onto them, recognise that you can't handle them right now, so you keep a distance. That's called wisdom, darling. Are you hearing me? This is the wisdom wing. That's what I'm saying here before, that informs your ability to have compassion, to know how to help a person, and often we can't help anybody. And that's where we are uh, in relationships, let's say, and you, you know, you're attached to the partner, but the partner goes off and cheats at other people, and they drink alcohol, oh, the poor thing can't help it, oh, they really mean well, and you keep getting bashed up every day. That is not kindness, that's idiocy. And that comes from attachment, darling, from foolishness, not from intelligence, and therefore compassion is stupid. Or like the compassion that a mother has for their kid, defending everything they do, that's not compassion, that's attachment. So compassion is... It's got iron in it because it's based on wisdom and knowing your own capacity. Do you understand, darling? So important, I tell you. What else? Yes. When we were talking about uh, this concept of, of self and, and things being programmed in each individual, it reminded me of, of a concept I was trying to get a hold of, um, ah. and I haven't been able to. Ah. Um, that of uh, codependent origin. Dependent arising, yep, that's Buddha's yeah. teaching. That's the one, baby. So can you help me understand it? I just, I oh, just, God. I don't get that <laughs> <laughs> the last five minutes, we're going to talk about emptiness. What's the time? What's the time? 8.40. 8.40. Right. 
But we're late. Yeah. Oh, we've got to go home then. <laughs> so can I have 10 more minutes? Yeah. Yes. Go. If you can explain the TPS over part in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to do it. Okay. So listen. Okay. Well, Buddhists really, you can say Buddhists, there's this really nice way to understand reality. All the stuff we're talking here, by the way, this leads us to the teaching of dependent arising and emptiness. This is the heart. This is where Buddha went. This is where he diverged from the Hindus. That's how deep he went in his own mind and he came to his own observations about how there is not even an atom of any independent self in there, which is where he, he diverged. So this is so the key way to understand that is to understand... The, so that's what they call ultimate reality. Then you've got conventional reality. And every talk, everything we've been talking here is conventional. Regular daily life. Don't get the two confused, you know? So then conventional reality is that everything is a dependent arising. Buddha says this is the fundamental law of the universe, that everything that does exist conventionally, a cup, a toilet, a carpet, a person, they exist in dependence upon various factors. So one of them, that things exist in dependence upon causes. I remember one lama, he talked about the, the, the phenomenon called Rabina. And that's why I remember it, of course. And he said, you could say everything in the universe up to the first moment of Rabina is a cause and a condition for the existence of Rabina. Because it's a logical thing that what is existing... So what Buddha is saying is this. We grasp this delusion in us, this ignorance in us, this ego grasping, believes this an independent, real, solid little me in there. And that's expressed in the way we think. I didn't ask to get born. We really feel I'm a co uncaused. It's, I'm an, an innocent victim. It's a person who didn't do anything to cause anything, isn't it? Well, Buddha says that's utter nonsense. There's some, there cannot be something that happens to you that you didn't cause. That's a logic for the Buddha. That's karma. So thinking about causes and conditions called karma is a powerful way to loosen the grip of the feeling that I'm this innocent victim. So depending on arising at the first level is, guess what, honey? You're the product of causes. Not external cause, partly, but not mummy, daddy, God, someone else, which makes you innocent. But you're, you're, you're the product of your own past causes, which is already loosening the grip of this little permanent little me. That's the first level. The second one, more subtle, is that Buddha says the settled level of dependent arising. We really believe in the depths of our bones that there is in here, among all these parts, that the first level of dependent arising is things come into existence in dependence upon causes. The subtler one is everything exists in dependence upon parts, bits and pieces. So what's your name? Will. Will. So here's Will. You're an example of a person. Conventional reality we're discussing. This is an example of a carpet. I'm an example of a nun. There's an example of a man. So we're examples of, of a person. So you're a person, conventionally. So this subtle level, Buddha's saying, deep in our bones, this ignorance causes us to totally believe that there is in here somewhere, somewhere among the bones, the blood, the pee, -pee the caca, the anger, the jealousy, and then all the parts of, of will, aren't they? Would you agree will is made up of bits and pieces of the body and bits and pieces of the mind? Would you accept that? Sure. That if there's only body, there's not will there. And there can't be only the mind until you're in life, you know, life being. So a combination of body and mind are the components of the thing called will. Clay and paint and a handle and a base are the components of a thing called a cup, right? So now, we will say, Will will say, you know, Buddha says, Will, and like the rest of us, due to this ego grasping, due to this ignorance, believes a billion percent that in here, sort of around here mostly, we believe, there is a special part that runs the other parts, that's the boss part, that is like the puppeteer or the landlord, and that part, baby, is called I. We believe that in the depths of our being, Buddha says, don't be ridiculous. First of all, there isn't one, but guess what, honey? You don't even need one. So, you know, so, that, what, so listen to our language. We will say, I have a hand. Now, I said two phenomena there, didn't I? I said one called I. Do you agree I said I? That's one phenomenon. Do you agree? Then hand is another phenomenon, right? Do you agree it's the hand? So that's two phenomena, isn't it? But where's the I that owns the hand? Excuse me, it feels like two things. I did not do that. You harmed me, we'll say. It's, it's a belief in here. There's this little kind of naked, little kind of self-existent, real little I that is the puppeteer that, that owns the nose and has the anger and does the loving and gets tired and is fat and is lazy. 
We believe our language expresses this. Buddha says that very dualistic language is an expression of this misconception. It's a complete nonsense. But hearing it is hard to hear. It's really hard to hear this. So give me, we'll do a little workshop. I might be more than five minutes, okay? <laughs> <laughs> a little bit longer. I won't take a lot. So if I say to you, okay, there was a phenomenon here. Oh, where's my cup? Oh, I forgot to drink my tea. Okay. <laughs> if I say, I, I have a cup and a, a lid. So if you got, if, hopefully our words are correct, right? When we speak words, they ought to be reasonable. That means you've got to prove what I say is relatively true. So then look over here, and you're going to prove pretty quickly that there are three phenomena I just mentioned. Would you agree with that? There's a lid, an eye, and a cup. Do you accept? And then I spoke the truth to you, didn't I? Good. Now, that means that these three phenomena exist without depending on each other. That means there are three separate phenomena. The cup, if it breaks, the lid is fine. If I walk out the door, the cup is fine. You accept that on a simple level. It's reasonable. And that's de this dependent arising here is these don't depend upon each other for their existence, do they? Do you accept that? Now, good. I will say to you, I have a nose and a hand. So do you agree with that? As a conventional statement, you can see that Rabina has a nose and a hand. Right? But the Buddha says conventionally, for that to be a conventional reality, you've got to find three phenomena that are independent of each other, separate from each other, and we believe there are. So let's prove it. There's my hand. Would you agree my hand can function without a nose? Do you accept that? The function of a nose is to, you know, snort. So my nose can snort fine without a hand. Do you agree with that? Can you accept that point simply? Can you hear my point simply? It's harder than the other one. But yeah. no, no, it's not complicated. Listen. Not these first two. The hand does not need a nose to, to hold my cup of tea, does it? Okay. My nose does not need a hand in order to blow my hand with this one, does it? My nose. So there's two phenomena that don't exist in dependence on each other. That's a reality. Now, look for the third phenomenon, please, called I, that doesn't depend upon a hand that doesn't depend upon a nose, that doesn't depend upon the pee, pee and caca and all the other bits. We believe there is. So we, if we did a little meditation, sort of pulling apart the components of will, you put the nose here, the eyes there, the piece of the pee, -pee the caca, all the atoms, of the bones, then you put all your pieces of anger and jealousy, you put your pieces all out there, and our belief is we'll find this little naked self, this little naked little will who's been found out as the boss in there, hiding away. Buddha says, you will not find such a one. This is, they, honey, they study this in the monasteries for 40 years and they go meditate for another 40, so we have to be patient. <laughs> <laughs> That's one way of seeing it. So to think about dependent arising, as they say in our tradition, is the king of logic to understand the conclusion. And the conclusion is, therefore, there is no independent. And that's why we don't chuck the baby out of the bathroom. We hear Buddha say there's no I. We become nihilistic. Of course there's an I. It's conventional will. But not in the way we think. It's quite subtle and nuanced. There's no independent. Very simply, there's no I in there independent from your nose and your brain and your body and your eye and your anger. So you can't say you don't exist. It's sort of like that. But you can't say there's a, we, want, we don't realise we want to point out an isolated, independent, intrinsic, ha ha, there it is. That's a misconception. So it's real subtle stuff, but it's not fantasy yogi talk. And it's quite subtle. And all we talked about so far leads to this. And so the conclusion from this is what? This is the point. When you realize the selflessness, there is no fear. This is what's amazing. When you've gone beyond all the neuroses, done the work of controlling your body in speech junior school, done the work of controlling your mind high school, now you get to this one. This is when you can go beyond the delusions. And in a sense, speaking very colloquially, when you realise emptiness, you become your real I, if you like. Infinite, wise, in terms of being in the body. Wise, compassionate, compassionate, marvellous. Action, no fear, no anger, no neurosis. I mean, that's practical. I'd love to be like that, please. <laughs> Do you understand? Yeah. Right, I'll that. So I want to sing a prayer now, at the end. <laughs> so this little prayer is just expressing of two in Tibetan. One is expressing, we call it a dedication. So it's just kind of saying, so given that Buddha says not a single thing we hear or think or say or smell or touch or see goes astray, everything is stored in our mind. So we, how marvellous we live, hour and a bit, all these things we've heard, 
May we sow the, these lava seeds we've sown. May we continue to nourish these seeds from this moment forward with our practice, our effort, our goodness, never giving up on ourselves, never giving up on others. So we can become this marvellous being, free of suffering, so we can be a benefit to others as long as we give. You know? And then the second little prayer makes the aspiration, may compassion grow and grow in the hearts of all. And I'll sing it to them. Yeah. 